Good to be here this morning. I want you to do this. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Psalms. Now, if you ever want to know how to find the book of Psalms, it's usually right in the center of your Bible. Okay? So, so go right to the center. And um, it didn't work for mine. I opened Jeremiah. So try again. It should be right in the middle of your Bible. You find the book of Psalms. It kind of depends on how the footnotes and all are arranged in there. And then go to Psalm 119. And for the sake of our visitors, what I've been doing is I've been preaching from Psalm 119 on the first Sunday of every month. And if you'll notice that Psalm, now, now folks that have been here, maybe get tired of hearing me say this, but I want our visitors to see this. Look at Psalm 1, it's been called the longest chapter in the Bible. And if you'll notice, it's divided into little sections of eight verses a piece. And on my Bible, it, it's got each little section titled, and you might say, well, that's a strange little word there. What, what is that little word? Like, like, shamic and aim. Look at verse 129. That's where we'll begin this morning. The word before it, it's got P, and it might have a little symbol by that. What you're looking at there is the Hebrew alphabet. And we've come to the letter, the, the 17th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the, it's P-E. Well, we were, would pronounce that P, wouldn't we? And, and that's what the letter is. And it corresponds to the P in the English alphabet. So the, the same sound in the Hebrew and that little symbol there that you see up on the chart, it comes from, and it might be right there in your Bible. In my Bible, it's got the symbol right in the Bible above that verse. And so this is P. Now here's what this means. For the next eight verses in the, in the Hebrew, now not in the English, because this was originally written in Hebrew. For the next eight verses, the first word of that verse in the Hebrew and the first letter of the first word of each of those eight verses begins with this little letter here, P. It's the way he wrote the song. He went all the way from, from the first letter of the alphabet to the last letter of the alphabet. Now we would say in English that he did everything from A to Z. I mean, when, when we say they go from A to Z, we cover everything, don't we? Well, that's what they did here only with the Hebrew, going in the Hebrew letters, and it's all about God's Word. Everything in Psalm 119 is about God's Word. In fact, I've said this, I think maybe every time. If you want to think about what Psalm 119 is about, it's about a man that is on his knees. This is, you can read much humility here, much longing here and pleading through this psalm. I mean, this man is having a hard time and he is on his knees and he is seeking God through his word. So just kind of imagine that kind of image there. And that's what David is doing in this psalm. And so we're gonna study these next eight verses and there's sort of a connection here between these eight verses. Now, look at the attention he's giving to God's word as we read this section. And he calls his word different things. Testimonies, words, commandments, but all through it. Let's read it and then let's see what we can learn from what David has said here. Thy testimonies are wonderful. Therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. I opened my mouth and panted. I longed for thy commandments. Look thou upon me and be merciful unto me as thou used to do to those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word. Let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression, uh, oppression of man. So will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant and teach me thy statutes. Rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. You see the attention he's giving here to God's word? 
And he does that all the way through the 119th Psalm. Look, look how it begins. Thy testimonies are wonderful. I want you to look at that word wonderful. Now again, if we could go back, if we were reading this in the Hebrew, if it was even possible for us to, to read Hebrew, which some of you might be able to, I, I struggle with it. I can't really read Hebrew. I, I do a little in Greek, but Hebrew is more difficult for me. But the first word in the Hebrew is the word wonderful. It would, they, they wouldn't say it that way because it'd start with a P sound, but it's that word, wonderful. And so if you did it in the Hebrew word order, that first phrase would be, wonderful is thy word. It, it puts the emphasis here, by putting that word first, the emphasis here is on the word wonderful. If I'm do what I want to do this morning. I want to impress you with how wonderful God's word is. That's what's happening here in this section. And there's reasons God's word is wonderful. And he starts going into that as we get into this psalm. And I'll show you that. Well, when we think of the word wonderful, what do we think of? Well, we think of something that is... Uh, some of the words that, that I had, it is delightful, it is pleasing, it is exceeding good, that is wonderful. And the Hebrew word carries that same idea with it of something, well, that, that, that is great. And sometimes we'll say instead, that's great, so, oh, that's wonderful. But it means more than that. I looked this word up in the Hebrew and you've got, there's study books and there's computer programs where you can do this and you can trace that word out. And, and I look, I read something about that word that, and it said miraculous. Well, I started looking at how that word was used. And so I found it in Exodus chapter 15 in verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? There's the word. And the, the wonders he's talking about here is the wonders that were done in Israel being delivered from Egyptian bondage. You remember that, that story? That's when Moses held up the rod and the sea divided in half and there was an open path of dry land through the midst of the sea. And the children of Israel were able to cross the Red Sea. And behind them was a pillar of fire holding back the armies of Pharaoh. And when the children of Israel got on the other side of the Red Sea, that, that pillar of fire moved out of the way and the army of Pharaoh saw that path through the sea and they said, let's go get them. And they headed down into the sea on that dry path and as they got out in the midst of that sea, God released his power and the water closed in upon them and it wiped out Pharaoh's army and the children of Israel on the other side singing this song that thou art fearful and praise it, doing wonders. That's how the word is used. It's used in the book of Psalms. I remember the works of the Lord, surely I will remember thy wonders of old. Thou art the God that doest Wonders. The heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord. Think of all the wonderful things that God did for Israel, leading them through the wilderness and feeding them with manna and, and the Jordan River being held back for them to cross and the, the walls of Jericho falling down when they compassed it seven days and, and the sun and the moon stood still. Wonder after wonder after wonder. And that's what these these verses are referring to. They're things that God has done that are wonderful, but they're, they're beyond that which man could do on his own. These are the things of God. That's how that word is used. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, when it's talking about the coming Messiah, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Now it goes on and says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. 
Jesus was no ordinary person, was he? He was wonderful. The, the very way he came to this earth, through the birth, a virgin birth. Well, that, that's beyond man's ability to, to do something like that. God's involved here. God brought Jesus into this, and he is wonderful. God in the flesh. That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? And we read the word wonderful in the New Testament. Now, this is from the Greek instead of the Hebrew, so it's not the same word, but the Greek word is used this way when it talks about Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. What's that word wonders talking about? It's talking about those, it's, it's talking about that time when he commanded the, the sea to stay still. He said, peace be still storm abated and the waters were still. He's talking about the time that, that he was able to put the spittle on the men's eyes and go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he washed and the man that had never seen was able to see. That's the kind of wonders. Doesn't that just make you wonder? Those miraculous things. That's involved in this word. And so when we read in the Psalms, thy testimonies are wonderful. It's not just that they're exceeding good. Listen. These words are come from God. This is not a book that man could have written. It, even a casual pursuit of this book, you come to understand that this is beyond that. It's written over a period of about 1,500 years. There's about, if you count them up, we don't know exactly, but there, there's about 40 different men wrote this book from all walks of life. And not only that, they're writing about the most controversial subject that there is on this earth when you're, you're talking about religion. People say, don't talk about politics and religion or you're, you're in a controversy. Well, religion is controversial. You've got these people over 1,500 years from all walks of life writing on the most controversial topic there ever was. And you put it all together and you got one book. And it doesn't clash. It harmonizes. They're together. Look, that just doesn't happen. This is a book that came from God. And that's included in that word wonderful. Thy testimonies are wonderful. They're wonderful because they came from God. But here's another reason they're wonderful. They're wonderful because they tell us things that we could not know if we did not have this word. They explain things to us. The world looks like a dark, ugly place sometimes, doesn't it? How, how do you make sense of this world and, and what we say? Well, we open God's word and God's going to explain it to us. And, and he reveals things to us that we couldn't figure out by ourselves. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Now, the simple here is not the simpleton. No, it, it, it's, this is the humble that's who it is. The, the reason some people don't get anything out of God's word is because they sit up here all high and mighty in judgment of God's word thinking, does this agree with what I already think? But that's not how you're supposed to read the Bible. No, we're humble. We're like little children. Except you become as little children, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so we receive his word. We're simple. We're not boasting ourselves up in pride. But with humility, receiving his word. And then it says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. Well, the American Standard Version translates it, the opening of thy words giveth light. I hope I'm not being too trite here if, when I talk about the refrigerator. You ever gone into the kitchen at night? It's all dark and you open the refrigerator door, and, and when you open the door, the light comes on, doesn't it? <laughs> and you can see. Have you ever seen a refrigerator with the light off? And, you open, and it's all dark in there, but you, with the door and the, the switch, think about opening your Bible now. Now, you're simple. Think about being humble, and you open your Bible, and all those dark thoughts in your mind, and you open it and, and, and see the light, Think of the light shining out of the pages into your eyes, enlightening your soul. 
as you come to an understanding of what this book is teaching, the light comes on, see? And, and it brightens up that dark world. And now we see, Paul talked about this in Ephesians 1, 17 through 20. He's talking about how I'm praying for you there in Ephesus, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom in the revelation and knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory. See, see the light comes on? You, you couldn't know these things until you open that Bible and you start reading your Bible and now your soul is filled with light. All right? It's wonderful. Because it reveals to us God is a God of mercy and love. Look upon me and be merciful unto me as thou used to do unto those that love thy name. What? <coughs> what is God like? Some people don't like God. That, that, it, that what they don't like is what they think God is like. They think God is out there trying to find a reason to send you to hell. That's what they think God's like. He's looking for you to make a mistake. Say, aha, they got him. That's why I can get rid of that one. And they think God is cruel and mean. But God's a God of love. Do you want to go to heaven? You don't want to go to heaven as much as God wants you to go to heaven. Do you want the people you love to go to heaven? Not, not as much as God wants them to. I tell you, God sent his son to die for them. He wanted them. Heaven, he wants us with him so bad. All that suffering takes place because he could bear that price and that gives God the justification then, see, for saying, okay, I'm gonna bring them to heaven. Because I paid that price. That's how much God wants us in heaven. God's a God of mercy. God wants to bless us. He doesn't want to punish us. You ever get mad at your children because you're, you're wanting to bless them and they're misbehaving. And instead of blessing them, you have to punish them and it just makes you so mad. And that's the way God is. He wants to bless us. He doesn't want to punish us. He's a God of mercy and a God of love. And we read these stories in the Bible, how he used to do that to those that love him. Just think what David would have known. What story, what Bible stories would David have known about? Well, he would have known about Enoch and, and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Joshua and those judges, including Samuel. He, he'd know the story of Ruth. And how God had been good and merciful unto them that loved him. And see, the thing that David knows, now that's who God is. And he'll be good and merciful to me if I love him. And so that's how the word gives us understanding. That's why it's wonderful. It explains God. The things written aforetime are written for our learning that we through. Now look at this. Patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Isn't that wonderful? Now, wonderful because it redeems us and it delivers us. Let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man. Uh, iniquity, dominion, I tell you what, people can get so wrapped up in sin that sin controls them. It, it might be they're addicted to some substance or, or it may just be an addiction of the mind where they're just so wrapped up in sin, the sin gets a hold of them. But God's word can free us from sin. It doesn't have to have dominion over us. We can have dominion over sin and we can overcome that with the help of God's word. Isn't that wonderful? And man that would oppress us, I tell you, God's word shows us. I, I think about John the Baptist. You remember when Herod put John the Baptist in prison? You know who the captive was? It, well, it was Herod. 
Herod was the one captured by sin. The only thing John was bound with was, was these, these walls around his prison. His spirit was free. You remember Paul, when he stood before the, the, those that were trying him and said, and, and it was Festus, said, Paul, your much learning's made you mad. He says, I'm not mad, most noble Festus. I speak words of truth and soberness, and I wish you were like I was except for these chains. Who is captive? It was his judges. They were captive to sin. The only thing Paul was captive to was, was physically in his chains. His spirit was free. So we can be free. God's word can set us free. And that's the way we need to live. Don't, we don't need to live prisoners of sin. We need to be free. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. That's the path to freedom. And so David says, I keep them. Why is David keeping the commandments? Because they're wonderful. That's the reason. Does he feel like he's oppressed by the commandments? Not David. Therefore doth my soul keep them. Look. So will I keep thy precepts. Look, make thy face to shine upon thy servant and teach me thy statutes. You see, by learning what God wants him to do, he knows he's going to have the blessings of the Lord. I want you to think about that yard in the winter that turns all brown and, and gray and, and it gets kind of ugly and then that, that sun starts shining on it and it all starts greening up. Make thy face to shine on me. I am weary. I am worn. I am worn out with this. God's face shine on us and gives us that life. I'm going to keep his word. It is wonderful. Now, it ends on a sober note. Rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. Life can be just filled with tragedy, can't it? And, and, I won't, and a lot of the tragedies of life we bring on ourselves. Now, all of them we don't, but some of them we do. And think about the ones you love. And some of them are suffering tragedies in this life because they have not kept God's law. And it just makes you grieve. Rivers of water, just crying tears over those. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he wept for the sins of Israel. Jeremiah 9 1, oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain daughter of my people. He's weeping for them because of their sin. Paul says in Romans 9, 2 through 4, I have great heaviness and continue sorrow in my heart, for I wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren. You see, his brethren had rejected Christ, and he's grieving over that. And Jesus himself wept. He saw the city of Jerusalem, says he beheld the city and wept over it saying, if you'd only known the peace that you have and what is to be taken from you. Talking about the judgment that's coming upon that city. Rivers of water run down my eyes because they keep not thy law. Elders in the church know this. I've seen elders just tears coming down their eyes because of the members that they love who have gone astray and rebelled against God. In tears, they've come to the conclusion we have to withdraw fellowship from them because we love them and we've got to wake them up and let them know they've gone too far. They watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. And then it says in Ephesians 4 and verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit. If you think you have ever wept over the tragedies in the life of those you love because they did not keep God's commandments. Think how God feels. Do you love them? You don't love them as much as God does. 
and we grieve the Holy Spirit of God when we turn from his commandments. The one verse I didn't mention in all this is 119 verses 131. I opened my mouth and panted for I longed for thy commandments. I want you to think of the, the deer. We sometimes sing as a deer panteth by the water so my soul longeth after thee. Think of the deer running across the hot dry plain thirsting, panting, hot. Oh, if it could only have a drink. And that's what the Bible offers us, the, the waters of spiritual life. We hunger and thirst after righteousness. David longed for God's commandments. Uh, he's not like some preachers. I hear some preachers that say, we, we, we don't believe in commandment keeping. David believed in commandment keeping. He believed in commandment keeping because he knew those commandments were wonderful. And he wanted to do what God wanted him to do. And so he longed for God's word that he might learn, that he might be taught so that he might know what he must do. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. I mean, this is not an oppressive thing God's asking us. He is here to give us life and to give it more abundantly. But listen, we've got to do it by his word. Now, that's what the psalm is teaching us. And so this man is on his knees. Life has gotten to him. He realizes that I need God. This is where we find him. We find him in his word. It's what I want you, what I want to do. Every time I preach, this is what I want to do. I want to convince you, if you want to be saved, you have to believe and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now to obey that means you turn from your sin. That's repentance. And you confess his name before men. And you're baptized into Christ. And you come out of that water a new creature. And then like David, I pant for this. I want to see what it is God wants me to do. Because I love God and I want to please him. His commandments are not grievous. They are beneficial. They are good for you. And they'll free you and redeem you and deliver you. And so if you'll respond to the invitation to be baptized into Christ, you have the opportunity as we sing this invitation song.